I've spent the last two months analyzing thousands and thousands of designs, good ones and bad ones, and this is what works. Now, as well as the last two months, I've been in the print-on-demand game since 2014, more than covering 10,000 hours in this field. And it was fascinating to see how designs have changed and developed, but also how so many principles of well-selling designs are actually exactly the same, even with the addition of AI. I used every single tool in my arsenal to analyze these designs to see you know, how many sales they were getting, their conversion rates, every little detail that you can imagine. I absolutely love analyzing data, and even though this took so long, it was more than worth it. There are six key takeaways from all of this research that will undoubtedly help you with your designs moving forward. The first key takeaway of successful designs was the fonts that people used. There are so many different types of fonts and it can be an absolute minefield out there when needing to pick one and one that needs to fit the theme and match the graphics if you are using a graphic and also one that's easy to read. Overall, it's not easy picking a good font. And I found that simple display fonts were used the most. And most of the time it was just one, but two fonts did appear more often than I thought. And I very rarely saw three or more fonts being used. Now, still on the topic of fonts, I noticed that when grungy fonts were being used, the most successful designs continued that grunge look onto the graphic. So instead of having a graphic and a font like this, you had a graphic and a font like this, where it all kind of matched and looked good together. Occasionally, but not really so often, script fonts were used, and not something I was surprised by. They were usually used in conjunction with some sort of matching display font. And one thing that I noticed is 99% of the time, display fonts were always uppercase, and script fonts were always lowercase. Now, I knew this would be the case, as an uppercase script font looks really, really strange, but it's nice to know that the data backs up that theory. The last thing I noticed with fonts is that more often than not, it was bolder fonts that would be easy to read at a distance, and sometimes thin fonts were used, but mainly to complement thicker fonts. We compiled a list of fonts that we use in our designs that get sales every single day. We made it into a fancy infographic and it's one of the many, many infographics that you get access to when joining the Print On Demand Hub. And the links to the hub are down below in the description. Now, before moving on to the second takeaway, if you haven't already subscribed and you're liking my content, please hit that subscribe button. We're getting stupidly close now to 100,000 followers and 100,000 subscribers, and it's really crazy. I've been doing this for eight years and it's just mad. Anyway, the second takeaway is colors. Colors play a huge role in the overall design and knowing how to tastefully create a design and how many colors to add, if it needs colors at all for that matter, it's a skill that will end up making you a lot of money. Now the most consistent graphic and font color was white, which isn't surprising as the most popular t-shirt color that sells is black. And when I say consistent, I don't mean you know the best selling. I mean the color that made the most frequent appearance. There are many designs that have other colors, but they're usually more random. So I can't say yellow or blue. Whereas white designs and white text seem to make an appearance very frequently, if not the most frequent. Now, when color was used in a design, I noticed that more often than not, it was some sort of retro sunset design or something like that. Now, retro sunsets don't need to be round or square or have a cutout of the silhouette. Sometimes the graphic use could make up that retro sunset look. When a retro sunset design was being used, the text that went along with it was almost always the same color as the lightest part of the sunset, just like this. And when the design wasn't a retro sunset, but still used color, I saw that one to three colors was used. No gradients ever, 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 ever. And complementary colors were used together. No harsh neon colors were used, such as neon green or neon red. With retro sunsets, you often found that five to six colors were in the overall design. 
A couple of times I saw some designs with way more colors than three, but after digging into their shops, I could tell that they were highly skilled designers and knew exactly how to use many colors in a very tasteful fashion. I wouldn't recommend someone starts out with this as it can be very hard to achieve. Here are some examples of retro sunset designs designed with more than one to three colors that actually work and your classic white design. The next key takeaway is the simplicity of a design. And this isn't to be confused with busyness because I know this can be quite confusing. You can have busy designs that look great and every element of that design is needed, but you can also have you know, a design that is complicated and over the top. Think about it like this. When you are making a design with a graphic and text, ask yourself, does it need this element to help illustrate the point or is it already obvious? For example, if you have a t-shirt that says best dog dad, does it need a dog graphic to go with the text or is just the text enough? And in this case, adding a dog graphic will do nothing to the overall message. It will just clutter up the overall image. And on the flip side, this design where it says this is not a drill, the hammer is needed to help illustrate the design. And without the hammer, the joke simply wouldn't land. What I found when looking at the best and worst designs was the best designs had the perfect level of simplicity to their design. So after creating a design, take a step back and look at it or come back to it later and think, do I need all of these elements or do I need maybe more elements for that matter. You want the message to be clear, but not shoved in your face. Before going over the next takeaway, I just want to tell you the products that I was researching and the products that I sell were t-shirts. So this is the most popular print on demand product out there. And it's the one, like I said, we sell ourselves across all of our stores. And we use Printify who, are now a long-term sponsor of this channel. And not only that, they are the only sponsor that I plan to work with. And that's mainly because a lot of people ask who I use and why I use them. So it made sense to get sponsored by Printify if I was going to be constantly mentioning and recommending them so often. And I don't plan on working with other sponsors because I just didn't want to do that. I like keeping my channel nice and clean of sponsors. But with Printify, like I said, I use them all the time. We personally use the Gildan 64000 via SwiftPod using Printify, and we have no complaints as of yet. And from what I can see and through all my tests, they have been the best platform so far. There is a link down below if you're still looking for a printing partner and want to use the same company that we use. I also talk a lot about them in our community. The next takeaway was placement. A badly placed design almost never sold. And this is an easy mistake to slip up on. Is the design too big? Is it too small? And in all honesty, it's hard to pin this down to an exact formula because every single design is different. Some need to be bigger and some need to be smaller. Each design needs its own individualized placement. And more often than not, you just kind of need some breathing room on the top, on the bottom and on the sides. And if we have a look at the Printify design space, we can see it's got a nice rectangle for us and this is our printing area. When adding a design, we can determine how big it should be. What I like to do is actually click the mock-up button so I can get a good understanding of what it's going to look like. Although I don't think these things are ever 100% accurate. And what you want to be aware of is the closeness to the ribbed collar, the closeness to the edge of the t-shirt. And what I saw when analyzing all these designs was the best ones had a little breathing room on either side and was about two thirds the way up the chest, basically around this box. Sometimes designs should be much smaller and that's the style that some people go for. It can be a very popular style and that's where like maybe there's sometimes thin text or a very small graphic around the center of the chest. And sometimes that does work, but it's not very common. And if you're ever struggling with this, the best thing to do would be to go to your wardrobe, look at some graphic t-shirts that you might have and just see how they have been placed. The next and probably biggest takeaway was humor. I may have only analyzed around 10,000 designs for this specific video, but in my 10 years, I've probably seen hundreds of thousands of designs, sold a huge amount myself too. And one thing, 
that seems to always prevail is humour. Funny designs sell. They just do. End of. You know, it, it's just as simple as that. Now look, if you're in a niche where funny works, try and make a good portion of your designs funny. The example I used before is, this is not a drill, would be considered a funny design. And I'm not expecting you to put a knock-knock joke on a t-shirt or anything, but if you can incorporate humor, that would be amazing. Now, why does funny work? Well, people love making others laugh. And if we just get scientific for a little moment here, Laughter releases endorphins, which makes us feel good about ourselves and others. And this good feeling creates a bond between two people and imbues a sense of togetherness in groups. The golden rule of friendship states that if you make people feel good about themselves, they will like you. And laughter does just that. It makes you feel good about yourself and the person who triggered your laughter. There's a lot more science where that came from. So if someone has the ability to wear a t-shirt knowing they will make other people laugh, they are far more likely to buy it. The sixth takeaway is the mock-up, and this is not one to be overlooked. Most of the designs that did well had the same style mock-up. There are three levels of importance to a mock-up. Level one, and the most important, is the clarity of the design. Is it immediately noticeable and recognizable? Level two would be the shirt. Is it big enough? Is it cut off, etc. And level three would be any optional extras that you want, such as accessories in the corner of your mock-up or something like that. This is how a mock-up should be looked at. If your accessories are too big and they're taking away from the design, make them smaller and less noticeable. But really, the most important thing with a mock-up is the design and the placement of that design. This is the only way a potential customer can see what the final product is going to look like. If your placement isn't on the mock-up right, it doesn't matter if you've got the placement right on the actual t-shirt in Printify. They won't know that unless they actually buy it. And in order to buy it, they need to see a good mock-up. The only indicator they have is the mock-up you're showing them. So make sure you get the placement right. Not just right, in fact, absolutely perfect. Make sure it's big enough. Make sure it has the breathing room at the top and on the sides and at the bottom. Just make sure it's exactly as it should look like in real life. And above all else, make sure it looks desirable. You want someone to see your mock-up and imagine owning it, imagine wearing it, imagine buying it. That is what you want. Now, the best mock-ups were flat lay or 3D t-shirt only mock-ups. I would never use a model mock-up as your main image. It looks terrible. And on top of that, the design ends up being way too small because the main element of a human mock-up is the human, not the design. And as we said earlier, the most important part of a mock-up is the design. Now, with all of these takeaways, it's important to note there are and always will be anomalies. Designs are subjective. It's not a science. But by doing this kind of research and analyzing like thousands and thousands and thousands of designs, we can bring this as close to a science as possible. Now, I just want to tell you, we have infographics detailing all of this information and on top of that, a specific course dedicated to just designing. Now, this is all in the print on demand hardware. The links will be below. And this is one course of over 10 other courses detailing every aspect of this business and how to run it yourself. The links are all in the description, as I said, if you are ever interested. And it comes with a huge amount of support from myself, from Lauren, and now from Chris, who has partnered with the Print On Demand Hub. Months and months of research went into this video, and I hope it helps you create better designs that sell more. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.